For those of you who haven't joined us before for our Sip in Science, uh, we really miss bringing you our community talks in our wonderful Lemon Auditorium at Whitney Lab. And because of circumstances that we all know, we decided to take a step back and try to deliver these in a little bit different way. So we're doing them as our sip in science a little bit earlier time. Hopefully you can have a sip of our green drink that we sent out uh, as you join us tonight. Just wanna go ahead and give you a reminder about our next one. Um, so if you are able to join us December 10th, we have Dr. Sandra Losgan at 6 p.m. She is our new Associate Professor of Chemistry here at the Whitney Laboratory, and she does amazing drug discovery through natural products. So she's looking at fungi and all kinds of things to find new solutions to disease. So you, you won't want to miss this one coming up. So just a little bit of housekeeping for tonight, just so you understand how this works. This is a webinar, so you guys can see us, but we can't necessarily see you all, but we can have you participate through the Q&A. So we have a Q&A uh, capability. If you look at the bottom of your screen and you click on that, you can type in a question uh, during the talk. And what we'll do after Kat's uh, behind the scenes tour she's gonna to give us and some information. We'll come back and um, I'll be asking Kat those questions. So be sure, you know, if you have turtle questions to put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those after our overview that Kat, Catherine is doing. Um, so the, the other thing wanted to let you know that um, after the Q&A, we'll just put up the reminder for the next the next talk. So we're so glad you could join us. We're thinking about all of our Whitney family out there. Hope everybody's staying safe and well during this time. And we're excited to tell you a little bit about turtles. So Catherine Eastman is our sea turtle program manager. And she actually joined the Whitney Laboratory seven and a half years ago and spearheaded with some community members, our wonderful sea turtle hospital. She really helped get the whole thing going we just so celebrated our five year anniversary of the sea turtle facility. So we thought it'd be good to, to bring this to you tonight. And um, before she was with us, she actually founded her own nonprofit focused on sea turtle conservation with her husband. And her background is in environmental education. She did her undergraduate studies at um, FAU and also at UNF here locally. So we're really pleased to have Catherine here today to tell us a little bit more about what's happening with the sea turtles. Kat, we're gonna turn it over to you. Okay, everybody. Let's get this up here. All right, everybody. So thank you for coming tonight, which is comfortable because everybody's at home. And um, let's see here. Hold on, my poll keeps on jumping up. <clears throat> um, and I'm super happy to be able to kind of give everybody a behind the scenes tour, uh, closed but still caring is the, is the title, the hashtag we've been using since March. Um, as we've all still been working here and the turtles have still been coming in. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I've been here for the last seven years and we just celebrated our five year anniversary. So our hospital uh, is, is just busting out the seams with turtles. And uh, I was supposed to come to you tonight from the treatment room. However, we got a stranding. So <laughs> I'm over here in my uh, less than exciting office. But um, so when we decided this year, we, we, we picked naming schemes every single year in the hospital. And um, so I just want to get something out, the, you know, out there before. So our five-year anniversary, we decided to do something special. And all of our patients are named for different uh, scientists, marine scientists, oceanographers. Um, and, and so you'll see that tonight as, as I take you through our patients. Uh, we still have a couple from our fourth year, so from, from 2019, 
Um, and those guys are, um, the theme is four. So you'll, it'll make sense when, when, you, when you meet a couple of them. Um, so our hospital is a really unique facility in that we, we rehabilitate sea turtles. We research on fibropapillomatosis, which is a tumor disease that our patients, all of our patients that we admit have, and we also educate. So we haven't done much education and community outreach during the um, pandemic, but uh, I'm, like I said, really excited to, to try this real different way of showing you into our world. So with that, I'm going to give you all a little behind the scenes tour. And so where we are, we're in St. Augustine, Florida. I know most of you in the poll said you're from Northeast Florida, but welcome those of you that are not. And this is our little hospital. It's quaint, uh, as you can see. And we have, um, we have four sea turtle tanks, which you're about to see here. Um, we're, we're really, really going behind the scenes. We rely on volunteers. Um, to, and you see one back there, to help us with all of our day-to-day -day activities, taking care of the turtles, uh, scrubbing tanks, uh, cleaning, laundry, um, everything. So these are each of our tanks. They're all a separate system, which is why we can have turtles quarantined and take the FP tumor disease. So Delta, Delta's from our four-year naming scheme. So she was, Delta's the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. Um, so Delta came in with a huge, huge tumor and monofilament wrapped around her front flipper. Uh, the vet team thought that we might have to amputate that flipper. And as you can see, she has all four of her flippers. So luckily, with some very intensive therapeutic laser surgery, we did the CO2 laser surgery to remove her tumors. Um, and believe it or not, some honey massages helped bring that, the feeling back to that flipper and she began using it basically like the day that we were talking about amputating it. So that's sweet Delta. Okay, and Fred, oh boy, Fred, Fred Utter. <laughs> Fred is a, uh, a fisherman's friend. So, so many times we find sea turtles that are brought to us because of, they've been caught by, by a fisherman. Um, when Fred came to us, not only did, did she, wait, no, we don't know if Fred is a male or female yet. Um, when Fred came to us, Fred had a fish hook and in his mouth. And not only that, when we x-rayed, had one in his esophagus. So it was an immediate tumor re or fish hook removal. Um, and, and now we're just waiting until it's time to schedule his his or her tumor removal. So you can see, hi Fred, that's a nice close up. And you know, Fred Utter is a, was a fish geneticist. Um, so we, we picked, we thought we needed a Fred for a name. That's a good one. But you can see those FP tumors. And Robert Payne, it's a very, very special community ecologist studied the keystone, came up with the keystone species concept. Um, so Robert came from Tomoka State Park and a fisherman caught Robert on a treble hook. And so in, in Robert's front flipper. And additionally, Robert has those FP tumors, but um, we are in the process of getting Robert ready to remove those tumors. And Robert is a, is a female. We found that out earlier today. We and here's Victor. So Victor Frankenstein, not a real scientist, but um, we're paying homage to literature here. Uh, Victor came in on Halloween, and um, Victor's a female. Also found out today, and this is just a real extreme case of those of those FP tumors. And as soon as she's safe for surgery, our vet will remove those tumors from her eyes. And Leanne, Leanne Armand <laughs> uh, is a very skittish turtle. And you can see when we get to her, 
She came from a, a marina. You can see kind of a healed boat strike injury across her carapace there. It's about 70% healed and came in, she came into us that way. Um, and small tumors everywhere. You are gonna be lucky enough in a few moments to see some of Leanne's tumor removal surgery. Um, this is just kind of a stressed out little turtle. So this is in our, our treatment room and our surgery suite and, and Dr. Burkhalter and Devin are getting her ready for surgery and scrubbing, pre prepping, breathing for her. And that's Jessica Farrell, our PhD candidate in the background. She's waiting to take any of those tumors that Dr. Burkhalter uh, excises with our CO2 laser off. So that's part of the research that, that we're working on here. And this special laser that we use is real minimal damage to the skin. And I mean, you, you guys can't even tell that surgery is happening, I'm sure. Um, and the handover of the tumor and, and Jessica checks to see where did it come from. So everything is mapped out that's removed and before it's, it's put in the deep freezer. So we have this other turtle, Edward Scissorhands, which is part of our four-year naming scheme from 20, 2019. And Edward Scissorhands is Tim Burton's uh, fourth movie. So again, the four-year fourth naming scheme. So Edward is, is getting ready for release, but we've spent several months uh, with Edward in the deep tank, deeper tank, larger tank, um, because Edward came in for buoyancy issues Edward's also a female. Um, she was found in a marina floating and within the first 48 hours defecated 75 pieces of plastic bag and sticker and labels uh, that she'd eaten. Um, so there was definitely some damage to her and that, that caused her to be buoyant. So we needed to be able to video 12 hour stints of Edward in a deep tank to be able to see, is she releasable? Um, can she dive? Can she stay at the bottom of, of the nature of the wild? Um, she's lightened in the sun, which is kind of interesting. It happens to sea turtles, not all of them. Um, but yeah, she's uh, definitely interested in what I have. Um, oftentimes we're about to feed or drop in something or grab her. So washbacks, I think a lot of you have heard of our washback, um, our washback drive for uh, October. And we thank you all so much for, for those of you who sponsored washbacks. This is just one day of paperwork for, for washbacks. Um, we have gotten anywhere from, oh, one or two to 67 washbacks in a single day. Um, so it is uh, pretty intense because every single one of those little guys you notice has a number or a label on them. Um, we have to keep track of them like a patient. So sometimes we have 25 or 35 of them um, in, their, in their little tanks, associated tanks. Uh, now the neat thing about washbacks is these are hatchlings that have already gone out to the ocean and have been washed back in. So they're post hatchlings and that sargassum seaweed you see in their little washback tank is their habitat. So you might notice when that sargassum comes on shore in the fall, well, their habitat along with them is washing in onto the beach. So they need to get a boat ride to get back out to the deep water. So we take care of them. Sometimes we have them for a month. Sometimes it's just a couple of days. If there is a boat ride that's, that's headed out to the, to the weed line or down south to the Gulf Stream, um, we try to hitch a ride, or at least our, our little turtles do. Um, hi, Ed. But um, not all of those sea turtles make it. Not all of these little guys are healthy enough. Some of them were, we end up tube feeding or, or even providing some um, daily fluids. Uh, most of them, they do eat right away for us. You saw the some little shallow floating baskets. That's how we can keep an eye on those that we're not so sure if they're eating on their own. And uh, that would be 
what washbacks do in the wild. So I said, not all of them make it. So any of our patients that die in our care, we have to do necropsies on, whether they're little or big. And I will tell you that we we published a study over over the um, over the summer of of some washbacks, post hatchlings that had ingested plastic, and we found during that those necropsies that like 96% of, of those turtles had plastic in their GI tract. So we're kind of opening up a whole other um, realm of, of research here for us. Um, but on a happy note, uh, some of those guys do make it. And this was just Monday, um, 200 uh, little baby turtles, so washbacks from our facility, in addition to other facilities along the Atlantic coast, got a boat ride out to the Gulf Stream. Thank you so much for U.S. Coast Guard Station Fort Lauderdale. Um, and so none of us get to go on that boat. We always ask, but um, we really appreciate the Coast Guard and, and others who are able to, to take those little guys out. You see that deep blue water. Um, and another exciting thing we've done recently is Richard, our satellite tagged uh, green turtle. So Richard, also a female, Richard Dawkins, named for the evolutionary uh, biologist. Uh, with a partnership with Cedro Conservancy in South Carolina DNR, we got a satellite transmitter and Richard was large enough. We were able to get this transmitter and Dan Evans came over from Cedro Conservancy to attach it and it's just like building a surfboard. So fiberglass, resin, poly resin, a couple hours drying time and Richard got to be released on November 4th. I think we released, released her right on the border of St. John's in Flagler County. And that's us, stormy kind of day. And you can see Richard. Richard's is larger than the dinner plate size, but Richard came in for again, the FP tumors, um, and was also a kind of a thin, thin debilitated turtle. And you will see, you can follow along where Richard is going, which I'll show you in just a moment. And so you can see that day that we started down south of Crescent Beach was Richard's first point. And we've been at 15 days of um, points so far. And Richard has made her way up to Cumberland Island. And a real more pulled in, this is as of this morning, I pulled this off, uh, has traveled 151 kilometers. So that's 94. 94 miles and you can see that is in Richards in the East River, which is right behind and kind of south of Cumberland Island National Seashore. So in my opinion, um, it's great that Richard has found an inshore protected body of water and it'll be interesting to see what Richard does the next couple of months. And since this size sea turtle is not typically um, satellite tag, there's not a lot of information about where do these smaller turtles, it's not an adult turtle, where do they go in the wintertime? What are they doing um, overwintering or foraging? So uh, we really hope that we get a couple of months or maybe more of uh, a tag attachment and, um, and that'll, be, that'll be exciting. And like I was starting to say, everyone can follow along uh, daily where Richard is, and you can go to our Whitney Lab website, you can go to the Sea Turtle Conservancy website and look for Richard Dawkins or just Richard um, and, uh, and follow along. So that's kind of, that's kind of a fun community uh, way of seeing where's Richard today. And there's a little highlight spotlight of some of our cast of characters you saw today. And with that, Okay. 
Great. Thank you, Kat. Thanks so much for showing us what's been going on in the Sea Turtle Hospital. I did just add our website to the chat. So if you haven't been to our website, you can go there. And if you click on our Sea Turtle section, there's all kinds of information. And um, we did get some good questions in the chat so far. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Karen Schwartz, who asks, what causes the tumors? So super, super great question. Um, it's it's a tumor disease that's been around for a very long time. It's been studied, first documented in the 1930s down in the Keys, um, in the Florida Keys. It's found globally. Uh, we've noticed this tumor disease advancing to more temperate areas globally. Um, it was kind of the impetus for the, the construction of our hospital because this was not typically a disease that we saw in this part of the state and all of a sudden we started to see turtles with this disease. So unfortunately with science you get a lot more questions than you get answers and that helps direct some of your experiments. So there's a herpes virus that is associated with this disease um, but it's not the causative agent and so some of what Dr. Duffy and uh, Jessica Farrell, who you saw in the video, uh, what the research is to try to understand why the turtles' bodies are building these tumors or making these tumors, and what, in addition to this herpes virus, is is causing these tumors to grow. So there, that was a really long answer that says we're not entirely sure. We hope to have more information um, soon, and we've our research program has is about three years young, I think. It's, it took a couple of years to get that started after our hospital opened. So I think research is three years young, but we, we have wonderful faculty dedicated to understanding uh, the fibropapilloma disease and its spread and, and how we can mitigate some of the impacts with rehab turtles um, and, sh and shorten their stay. So in addition to just removing the tumors, um, also some therapeutics, some medications that we've been able to determine through sequencing the, um, the tumors. So that's kind of, you know, baby steps, but exciting. Great. Yes. And our new faculty member just joined us recently to study sea turtles. So we, we have our first dedicated faculty, um, Dr. David Duffy, who's joined us to do this work. Um, so our next question has to do with um, what type of turtles we see. So Elizabeth Ross has asked, are these all green sea turtles? So all of our patients that you saw that were in the, the kind of quarantine tanks, those are all green sea turtles. And the FP disease primarily impacts the, oops, I got distracted by a question, <laughs> impacts the green sea turtles. Um, however, the washbacks, the post hatchlings that you saw in the in the smaller tanks, the majority of those were loggerhead turtles. So Florida is lucky enough to see five different species of sea turtles in one way or another, and um, and particularly the green turtles are impacted with the FP disease. Uh, loggerheads are too. We um, are not quite don't quite have the space. We haven't had the opportunity for a, a loggerhead with with tumors yet, um, but uh, next time, soon. Um, so right now, yeah, the dinner plate size juvenile green sea turtles are, are who we see the most of. Okay, we have a question from Katie Ross who wants to know how many washbacks have we had since we opened? Gosh, you know, I had a feeling someone was gonna ask that question and I did not tally, mm -hmm. I did not tally that. Um, Katie, I will get you that information because I know how to find you. But if I had to guess, Devin, are you watching? You can put the answer in the chat. Um, it's several hundred each season. And we started out with, yeah, I don't have the answer. Probably about a thousand since we opened would be my would be my guess a couple hundred to 300 each year um yeah so there katie i will email you with that answer 
So we have another question about washbacks. It has to do with our campaign, I think. Did you really name my washback once Fred wants to know? Okay. So we you notice that okay. How we said there's a there's washbacks are so cute, but so much work. And the paperwork, the paper trail, they they're all labeled. So we labeled them by alpha you know, IJ, I think I got IJ 2020 CC in today. And so that's his name for us, for our hospital. But we loved to read all of the, um, the names that came in through the campaign. And I can tell you there were some staff favorites. So, um, so thank you. But we need to keep it to two letters to write on the back of their shell. So we, we couldn't put the full name on the shell. And we do have a list of the names on our website now. So if you go to our news page, there's a full list and there's some great names you'll see up there. So um, we have a question about the tumors. Can they grow back after being removed? Yes, um, not in not all cases. Um, that's part of, so all of our patients are admitted um, because they have the tumor disease they're all going to undergo at least one or two, many times six surgeries to remove those tumors. Um, and after the final surgery, and we, we space those surgeries about four to six weeks apart for healing time, um, we do have to keep a close eye on, on, on those spots to see if they're regrowing. And we, every, Every two weeks, we take a series of 16 photos um, of every patient we've had, we have, and uh, we can also, through technology, um, kind of watch digitally if there's any regrowth that by chance maybe we, we miss with the naked eye. But we're, um, unfortunately, sometimes the regrowth is very fast and rapid. And most often we, um, we will double check uh, an internal a CT scan to see if there's internal tumors. And that, unfortunately, there's nothing, no coming back from that. So um, we do, even though we have to euthanize, humanely euthanize turtles um, with internal tumors, or if, if there's just, they just, the disease has the best of them. Um, we, we use all of that information um, in our research. So, you know, our, the rehab staff works very tightly and close with the research side to make sure that, that all of the samples that could be taken that can shed some light on this um, are taken um, once the turtle's um, no longer with us. Good question. Sure. Yeah, it was a great question. We have another one about fibropapilloma or FP as we call it for short, um, is it a growing problem? Is it a big problem? And how many turtles, do we know how many turtles are affected? So, okay, it's geographically spreading and the green turtle population is growing. So is that spread a function also of a growing population of turtles? So that's a possibility. Um, the green turtles are Suitable habitat is um, another part of this where Northeast Florida was not maybe 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, not necessarily suitable habitat for a more tropical uh, species of sea turtle. But as plants and animals are migrating with climate change, um, we become uh, more suitable for green turtles. So. At one time in sea turtle world, uh, FP was thought to be something that was going to completely decimate the entire green turtle population globally. Um, that's not happened um, yet, but we definitely try to use what we can learn from this disease and the, even the spread of disease, um, the migration of disease, uh, to be able to hopefully share that in the human world, you know, that the, just understanding how diseases are spread in the marine environment is, is something that is very critical for, for not only conservation of endangered species, but also for, for human health as well. 
Um, we have a question about how people can help. How can we help someone ask? Kay Henderson asked us. Oh, Kay. Hi, Kay. Um, how can you help? Um, one thing, of course, is to support support us, whether it be or us or any um, facility. We're, we're closed. We're not able to offer our public tours, which is our source of revenue. So financial help is always extremely um, helpful. Um, particularly in times when, you know, we had to, we, we couldn't have volunteers on site for, for months. So we've just started welcoming them back. So yay, thank you. Uh, we can't do this without, the, they're the backbone of our, of our facility. Um, but also spreading the word, becoming more um, an expert or steward yourself on whether it's this disease, whether it's conservation, whether it's what you can do to ameliorate the effects of climate change, um, you know, things like that. That is a big picture help. Um, but we definitely, and, and Jessica definitely has those uh, links to how you can um, financially help us. Um, all of that goes right into the hospital to, um, to feed all those mouths you saw and, and all the, uh, the equipment and the consumables that we're using all the time on our patients. We had a good question about our next steps for a new hospital and our plans. So did you want to touch on that a little uh, bit? We're, we're, this is, uh, this is exciting because we're kind of embarking on hospital 2.0. Um, you saw the, from my, one of my opening shots, kind of our I don't want to say meager beginnings, but you know we we had an issue and we threw blood, sweat, and tears into it and kind of carved out our little hospital and filled up within the first week or so being open and have pretty much stayed full. Um, I think that's always the case. You outgrow something as soon as it's done being built, um, but we really we really need to expand and we've gotten some great opportunities with the help of, of Jessica and, and the foundation um, advancement team uh, to secure dollars for Hospital 2.0 and Marine Lab uh, 2.0. So I don't think you guys are calling it 2.0, but we look at it that way. Um, so we can have more space, more staff, more tanks, not have to transfer patients away because, you know, we only have space for, I think we had nine uh, the weekend of our anniversary, um, we, they just all came in. We were slammed um, and we had to turn patients away, even tumor patients. And so having more space would be definitely something that, that we won't have to turn animals away. And we're, you know, we almost had to send off some animals because we're pretty full right now. And we're looking at the beginning of the winter season, which means there's going to be cold stuns in our area. And you can't really get into the beginning of a potential high stranding season when you're already full. So um, hospital, new hospital, it will be such a welcomed um, treat. Yeah. And anything else Jessica would like to add about the, the, the new building and, and well, stuff? We're really excited about the community support that we've received for the hospital. So we have been working on fundraising for that for a number of years now. And it is our university's top priority to help us garner some state support as well. So, so far we've been able to um, have community members participate and we are going to the state to help us see this dream come true and help more turtles learn more about our environment, share that information with you all. So. We're excited about the next steps with the Sea Turtle Hospital and our laboratory building. So speaking of the laboratory, we have a question from Mark Q. Martindale. You might recognize that name. He is our director here at the laboratory. Thanks for <laughs> roasting me. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know why most of our patients seem to be female now that we're finding out. Oh my goodness. We, um, one patient that I didn't highlight, Sylvia Earle, is a male. We just found that out about four o'clock this afternoon, but um, I didn't include her in my little video. Um, in sea turtle population biology, we think that the male female or the female male bias ratio is three to one, three females, one, one male. 
Um, you don't need a lot of guys out there. Um, they are not monogamous. So um, why, I don't know. I really couldn't tell you why. Um, other than there's just more females out in the population. Um, we have a question about where we get our water for the tanks. Ooh, we have the best water. And I will tell you, it is from our pristine Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's sand filtered because the pipe comes right underneath the sand. So it's naturally cleaned. Um, it's pumped and then gravity fed through our tanks, um, uh, cleaned before it exits the, the turtle tanks. We have ozone and um, on all of our tanks. And uh, one really important thing with rehab sea turtles, and this is probably true for the, the creatures that the researchers use in their laboratories is having excellent water quality is, is imperative for not introducing anything else into a system. Um, when you have sick sea turtles with a disease or open wounds after surgery, um, having access to the amazing clean uh, system, the ocean right out there um, is critical. I mean, and, and we're lucky we don't, we don't have to worry about oil spills because we don't have offshore drilling on our side of the state. Um, so let's hope it stays that way. And um, if we needed to, we could close off our, our seawater system to our sea turtle tanks and run a, you know, a, closed, a closed loop, a closed unit. Um, but we are, are really thankful that we have the, the cistern, the seawater system is the lifeblood of the entire lab. So without it, you don't have a marine lab. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our questions for tonight. Um, I just got another one. And I think after this, we're gonna wrap for tonight because I know Kat's had a busy day in the hospital too. <laughs> so we have a question about microplastics. Do we worry about micro yeah, microplastics in the seawater? Oh, in the seawater. Um, hmm, that's a really good, that's an interesting thought. We could probably run, um, it would be interesting to, I'm, you're, I'm thinking, so I'm sorry, I'm up there. I have never taken a sample and run it through a really, really small micron filter just to see what's in there. Um, I don't know. Do I, I don't, I don't even worry about it in my tap water at home, but perhaps I should. Um, that's we a very have... interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe Mark Q. Martindale has an answer <laughs> for that. It reminds me of that. We had an intern, uh, REU research intern, do a study testing seawater in inland in St. Augustine. And they did find with these really fine, you know, ways they were able to see different levels. So maybe we could take a look at it. We have the capability, um, but she spent all summer just trying to test like a few samples, so. It'd be interesting, but I think since we run, since the, the pipe is underneath our sa the sand, mm -hmm. I feel like that would have some aspect of filtration, but good question. Now we'll certainly be doing a Boy Scout project on the weekend <laughs> on that one. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kat, for joining us today and um, participating in our SIP and Science. Uh, we hope that everybody out there is staying safe right now. We hope you enjoyed the session. We try to mix it up each time and do something different. I found it really fun to watch the turtles and see what's going on with them uh, with your film. So thank you for sharing that with us. I think Heather is going to put up our next session so that you can see what we have coming up for you. And we do hope you join. And then um, because of things where they are, we, we think we're gonna continue to do this remotely for a while. And the fun thing is we're reaching people outside of Florida too. So uh, we'll be putting up some dates for the spring uh, here you know, towards December. So hope you can join us for the next one, December 10th. Everybody stay safe out there. This is Jessica signing off and thank you, Kat. 
Thank you all you. have a good evening. Bye, everybody.